Okay. I'm trying live in a long time. Um, so, so the uh, if you know from my YouTube community page, I asked interesting questions, something that will jump and turn my camera on. So I'm like, you know, instead of taking one question all every week, maybe I can just keep answer whatever questions, you know, um, I can. So if, so the first question is from Parikshana Mathur. And Parikshana asks, the, in the autobiography of a yogi, many times it comes that the time was not right. Same as in astrology, we say, let the dasha come. Based on your experience and discussion with your gurus and teachers, I guess, what exactly is the right time and why we can do right time? What will happen if we force it to happen? Why even the yogis had to wait for a particular time? So again, yeah, this is important. First of all, certain yogis go beyond the dashas, beyond the transits, beyond everything. But it's very rare. Okay? It's very rare for... Um, some most yogis to not be affected by their karma so even if you look at let's say uh who's a ramakrishna the uh, teacher of vivekananda okay he had some issue i believe on his kidney or somewhere and he refused to get treatment for it he said no i'm getting my past life karma be, uh, uh, this particular health issue is based on my past life karma. I have to pay it off. So they know that they have to pay that particular karma off. And yogis, when they go into a different dimension, they can see the timeline. They can see what has happened, what it is, and what is coming. And they can see, this is my biggest karma that is to come in three years. And then what happens is, a yogi can either do penance related to that particular karma. So, for example, even in autobiography of a yogi, Lahiri Mahasai had a boil on the back in his back when his time came to take Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And he didn't want treatment for it. He's like, this is it. This is the way I'm going to go. In the same autobiography of a yogi, Mahavtar Babaji took a piece of burning wood and threw it on the wrist of one of the disciples. And he's like, what did you just do, Babaji? He's like, well, you were supposed to uh, get really badly burnt because of your path like karma. I just helped you page your karma off. So even then, when you're with somebody as divine, as high, highly manifested being as Babaji, he himself said, you have to pay the karmas off. So yes, you have to pay karmas off, but again, there are also then way to nullify those karmas, right? There are ways to get those karmas down, which again was our biography yogi is like a Gita for uh, ignorant people like me, you know. And there, Sri Yukteswar said to have this three metal bangle, which is uh, made of gold, copper, and silver. It kind of acts as a lightning rod that that is on a building. So a person uh, or, the, or the building can take the actual current within the ground instead of dealing, hurting the dwelling. So there's all these little things. So yeah, you can't go beyond your time. It's, it's, it's really, it's a very complicated matrix of karma. Then uh, Nano asked, every profession has a code of ethics. I've not heard many talk about the ethics of astrology, the reading, the readers, and the client may be worth discussing. I've actually discussed this back in 2013-14. I don't even know what Q&A video it was. And I've said, I will never, uh, this is one of my principles, after going to so many astrologers, you know, because I used to do that in you as there are so many astrologers themselves. I got reading from people from India. One thing I noticed, just they go directly to the negative predictions for people. And I since, and they made some horrific predictions that never actually happened. You know, they were supposed to be happening literally six years ago, 10 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. Horrific. 
and they scared me to death at that particular time when I was like 21, 22. So then I made a principle. Okay, now that I'm going into world of astrology, I'm going to be completely different than every... It has already happened. I'll say something in the reading. But if I see something coming, no, because when the person goes away from my reading, they should feel hopeful. They should be like, wow, at least I have some good thing coming in. And if I do see something really, really bad, I would always just talk about it in a very subtle way where I will talk about the remedy first before I even go into like, wow, oh my goodness, this is horrific. Things going to happen with you or this family member. No, never, ever, ever, because you are, you are always interfering within the karma of the individual and the client and, and God. And once you intervene, you better know the fine line. You better know the fine line of what you're doing because you're going to take on some of those karmas of those people. When you tell somebody, you know, you're going to get into a horrific accident, you know, uh, literally today, I'm looking at the person, you're going to get a horrific accident today. Well, guess what? Now that the person has this absolute fear, that karma is now given to the astrologers that, you know what? You're going to have to deal with this fear too, because you gave it to them. That's not what the rishis did back in the days. First of all, the astrology that we do today, jobs, marriage, promotions, right? Relationships. That was the last concern for the rishis back then. For them, it was about what is the purpose of this soul? Why are you here? You shouldn't be here. You should be in Hiranyaloka or somewhere else. Why are you here? Let's help you complete the karmas. So they actually always kind of looked at the pending karmas. What is the pending? Why are you born? Let me just tell you how, why you're born so I can just not deal with that, you know? So that's that. So I would never, and of course, a lot of people even ask me, you know, um, like for example, a lot of, lot of people, even just two, three days ago, somebody asked me in one of the readings, hey, can you tell me where exactly you got this? I want to get this. I always see your videos with this particular bangle and you mentioned this bangle. Can you, I would never say that. Because first of all, I'm not being endorsed. And you got to understand, every day, every day I'm getting endorsement deals, especially from India and Dubai. Do you know, if I took some of these endorsement deals with jewelries and gems, I, I would make 2000 a day, 2000 a day, easy. But you would have never, ever, ever, ever have seen me endorse any astrological product of anybody else. You've never endorsed me any gem shop, nothing. I said, this is the remedy. You go do it yourself. I don't want to be involved. Because especially what happens is even if I say, oh, I bought this from here. You go and you get it. You have a bad experience with them. Oh, he told me to get it from here. It's a bad experience. Mm -mm. Not me. Not me. You know, I have that control. You know, I, I don't get swayed like that with the money that, that I get offered. No, I'm good. Then the next question. The other question is from Mitja. What's the name? Mitaja Erzin. Mitaja Erzin. Pilates yoga. I'm a Pilates yoga teacher and I'm dealing with spine issue, deformation daily at my work. I notice that many of them are in a family. So my question is how family karma can relate to the spine, spine. Well, for that, yes, of course, every issue that you deal with, either it's your own karma or your family curses that you deal, that you're born with. And of course, spine is connected with many planets, especially sun, Ketu, Mercury. Okay, because remember, spine is what? Spine is like a serpent. This is the head of the serpent. And in the back is the tail of the serpent. That's all we are. If you take away our head and spine, there's nothing. There's no you. Okay, there's no me. There, there's, that's all we are. We're like literally serpents with additional body parts, like hands and feet. So, yeah, for that, I mean, we, we can't, I can't answer that because I don't know your chart. I don't know exactly what we're looking at. We have to look at that. We have to look at your D30 and D12 chart to see exact health issues, you know? So, but yes, there is that. Then,
the next question is from Vaishali Sharma. So Vaishali is, and I'm looking here because I'm looking at my desktop. This is my laptop because I don't have a webcam. So, um, so she says, I got confused sometimes whether or not Jupiter expansion quality or nullifies the malefic. For example, you said the Jupiter aspect on Mars in the eighth in Navamsha can to some extent nullify the malefic heaviness of this position. What about when it sits with Mars? Would it nullify, expand its malefic impact? No, Jupiter will always, Jupiter, first of all, its first job is to save. Save and expand in a positive way. When it cannot expand in a positive way, it simply protects. That's what happens with Jupiter. That's the first thing. Either it's expanding in a positive way or it's just simply protecting whatever you know, um, is supposed to happen in a negative way. Second thing is each planet, first they will act on their karkavasta. Is it benefic? It is malefic, meaning uh, satvik, rajas, tamasic. The second element it will go by is by its lord placement. What house is its ruling? So Jupiter for Taurus ascendant will rule the 8th and 11th house, which is a trick house. For Libra, it rules the 3rd and 6th house, trick house. Then you look at the karkas of Jupiter. Jupiter is a karka of 2nd house, 5th house, 9th house, 11th house. So when Jupiter is with Mars, let's say, for example, and the dasha comes in of Jupiter, well, first of all, you will see that Jupiter activates its own karkavasta. This is why it receives the highest of Sarvashtakvarga points. Is the most benefic. So it brings benefic effect. And if it's not doing that, it protects it. So we get that. Then it's lordship. What would be the lordship if let's say it's a Libra ascendant, you know, and Jupiter's conjunct Mars somewhere? Well, it's gonna also do the third and sixth house, which means competitiveness, sports, media, communications, you know, dealing with debts becomes active. Then Karkavasta comes into play. So let's say you started your Jupiter Dasha in age 20. So till 36, you're going to have Jupiter. So what happens then, Jupiter will definitely bring you money, bank balance, children, interest in higher education, um, social and cultural events, okay, uh, conferences, um, you know, making new connections. Now those connections may harm you, may benefit you. Again, we have to see where exactly and how Jupiter is placed. It's a mixed, it's a mixed event. Jupiter can never be great. Like, for example, for Cancer Ascendant, even in Lagu Parashri, it said that Jupiter would give great results because it rules the ninth house with Pisces. But the thing is, Capricorn is in the sixth house. And I've seen many times with Jupiter Dasha with Cancer, it becomes half trick. It, br it brings about dealing with enemies, dealing with competitions, dealing with, you know, uh, grinds of the work. And remember, Jupiter Dasha, Jupiter is a guru. If Jupiter Dasha comes in, what happens? That means that the experience of the guru becomes active. And when you're with the guru, you think guru is going to like easily give you everything like, oh, you're hungry. Let me give you this nice, amazing food. There you go, because I'm Jupiter. No, you know what Guru is going to do? Take a bowl, go outside, beg for food, and then bring back rice and dal, whatever you get, and they'll cook and eat. eat. You know, even if it's, there's some humbling experience that even Sri M dealt with in auto, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, his, his own autobiography, Apprentice to a Himalayan Master, which I've literally read like eight to ten times already. You know, so... Gurus will humble you. So Jupiter Dasha is there to humble you. It's not there to always benefit you. Like Jupiter is going to make you work. So when you hear, oh, benefit Jupiter. Yeah, it's a benefit because it's going to give you wisdom. At the end of Jupiter Dasha, you will know what life is. And that's what Jupiter is. Okay. Mm. Let's see. Uh, okay, so next one, wait, okay, Vishali Sharma already asked that, 
Okay, but this is interesting question, so I'll take another question from Vaishali. Um, on your Keras vlogs, you had a series on compatibility, and regarding that, I have a question. Let's say hypothetically, the match is really good, and when you check by superimposing, it's long-lasting compatibility. However, what if there's a heavy malefic influence on the seventh house regarding in one of the couple's chart? Would the malefic influence on the seventh house overpower the effects of the favorable superimposing of the partner's planet? No, just because you have a malefic in the seventh doesn't mean that it is only there to do bad. Like, for example, you got to just know the basic fundamentals that why is Saturn given its exaltation point in Libra? Right. And why is Saturn is given his directional strength in Libra, which is the seventh house. So seventh house is the directional position of Saturn. Well, it's a malefic. So what's going on? Well, because Saturn represents the long term commitment. Saturn represents long term commitment. Marriage is supposed to be a long term commitment. And marriage is not. See, many people say, well, marriage was this contract made between village heads for lands and then and then kings got their princesses married to other prince for the two kingdom to come out no these things came later on the original 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 meaning of marriage was that two individuals need to experience dharma artha kama moksha together and eventually both of them helping each other to go towards moksha the companionship was to be of like Shiva and Parvati. Okay. So the marriage is not simply the, some contract or deal. Marriage is actually to lead you. This is why it also said, even in Upanishads, that householder yogi, the one who runs family, the one who uh, has spouse, wife, children, they have the highest of responsibilities of a yogi instead of just somebody being a sannyasi because then you have you're not sacrificing anything you're not sacrificing anything you, you it's like you tell a <clears throat> like a beggar or somebody who who's on the street saying that you know i sacrificed so much in my life i have no family no wealth nothing no you didn't sacrifice you just don't have it if you had it you know, if you had a million dollars, you left your million dollars, you left your beautiful home and spouse and children, and now you're out there begging, that sacrifice. Otherwise, it's not sacrifice. So <clears throat> even if Mars is in the seventh house, okay, Mars, of course, you know, does not find this directional strength there. But Mars may not actually bring arguments. If Mars is especially in certain signs and nakshatras, what it does is that gives you a royal-like partner. Partner who becomes a royal, who fights with you, but also for you. That's what happens. So, malefic does not mean that everything is doomed. Sure, every couple, every marriage has some flaw. They're going to fight and argue. Malefic in the seven does not necessarily mean that. But based on its sign, nakshatra position, Another aspect upon that malefic, now that becomes different. But if it's a compatibility that I showed you guys with Jupiter and Moon, I believe, or Jupiter and uh, Ascendant, of that, hey, this is a match. And then whatever planets are there, yes, you guys will fight, breaker, but you guys will last long. So that's how it works. Then, actually, I had a question saved which I was going to make one video of, but then I decided to do this live. So the main question was also from, uh, which one was the question? Okay, it's from Dora Batosi. Dora Batosi. Do you have any tips on how we can master the planet so that the transit and Dasha period are not intensely horrible? Well, so there again, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. Okay. 
But there's again, if you read the autobiography of Yogi, it is gives you some very important remedies. Like especially when Sri Yukteswar was talking about one of uh, I think it was Jitendra, the friend of Yoga Mukunda, or somebody else, and he had him wear the bangle and wear some gem thing because some transit of Saturn was coming, and especially for Yogananda as well. He said the plants are gonna frown upon you. Uh, very soon in the transit and he said to wear these three metal bracelet to avoid that although he told yogananda to wear a lead instead of uh, i think uh copper i don't know he says yeah silver and lead bangles that and the other biggest one was that yogananda's when he was mukunda his mother said to or no it was lahiri mahasai telling a person that if you want to have my picture in your home as a protection, fine, you should put the picture. But if you're going to just have a picture as a decorative thing, it's not going to do anything. So as a protection, you can put my picture because God is working through me. So it's very important when it comes to transit to have divinity in your life. Whether you're a Christian, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, if you're an atheist, then again, then omnipresence is like, well, this person does not want to have that connection so they can go through these highs and lows tied on their surfboard. Okay, fine. Because that omnipresence God, instead of a surf, it becomes a boogie board where you can ask, where you can go and sit or something of that nature. So it's very important to have these divinities in your life. But one of the other important ones that I'll also tell you, Vastu. Vastu becomes very important. You know, for example, for Shani Transit, and I've also said this in my Keras vlogs, uh, not vlogs, um, on one of my Q&As, maybe two months ago. You know, this is why it's important to watch when I put up these videos that I said, like, especially for Shani Transit, and I got to show you guys the degree point because I um, I don't know that this 360 degrees. I don't know exactly. So if, let's say I'm looking at south. It's from 160 to four degrees. To 180 degrees, you put a brass statue of Hanuman in that direction, which helps you to nullify those effects of the male man called Saturn, who brings and gives those males, you know? Um, so that, those things help. Vast, but Vastu is very, very important. <clears throat> That's pretty much having kind of like a metal bracelet like this, you know? So, uh, and of course, you know, like for Jupiter, like for Jupiter's quality, gold becomes very important. Having gold and, not, and a lot of people will tell me like, oh, I have an 18 karat gold. I'm like, no, you got to have 22 karat or more. You got to have 92 per percent gold in anything in order to get the full effect of it. If it's 24, that's the best. Because you got to understand back in the days, the kings, they didn't just wear gold for like showing off. No, there is the big significance towards focusing on their health and wearing the golds and even gems on their mukutta. So, so our friend is saying, can you please Throw some light on the relationship between Mercury and Ketu conjunction and difficulty in learning foreign languages and affinity towards ancient studies. No, actually, again, depending upon other malefic influences on Mercury and Ketu, then you'll have difficulty. But this is actually a conjunction where a person will be interested in languages. Because what's happening now, people are learning technical language, coding. Coding is a language. That's all it is. If coding wasn't here, you would be interested in learning French or Hindi or Sanskrit or something. <coughs> so 
Mercury and Ketu conjunction cannot bring difficulty. It actually makes great mathematicians. It makes, of course, great intuitive people going to spiritual uh, life. But the thing is, based on other conjunction and aspects on Mercury and Ketu, yes, things. Okay. But Mercury and Ketu shows that there's a strong past life connection with learning languages, communication that must be accomplished in this life. But I, in order for me to go into detail, I, I mean, I can go into much more details on this Mercury Ketu, but we don't have enough time and space in this particular session on this. Uh, GS, in your experience, what are the major struggles faced by an astrologer in practicing astrology? Not enough time for research. Because if you're not researching the with the constant change of time in society, then astrology can become useless. Because if you get an astrologer 500 years ago and tell them to do a reading now, okay, and they haven't lived through these eras, they haven't lived through the changes in society, they will it'll be completely useless. Like if you're showing an astrologer 500 years ago, a chart of somebody, you know, a boy who's like 14 years old, they're like, oh, they should be getting married now. And they will go into farming. Well, instead of farming, the person is probably in architecture, an architect or person is doing civil engineering. What they're saying is farming. So one of the big problem is not enough time for doing research. And number two, you will have issues in practicing astrology if you're not focusing on your spiritual life, spiritual sadhana. This is something even Vara Mira said. And even uh, who's that grandfather of um, Bibi Raman, Surya Narayan Rao, he even said, you can learn all the techniques, but if you're not doing your spiritual sadhanas, all that will go into waste because you will not get the result. So that's very, very important. And of course, the other major struggles is, is um, you know, especially family life, responsibility of family life. And that's what cuts the time for research. And studying because this is supposed to be like 24 7 thing astrology is not a nine to five thing it's the moment you wake up and the moment you go to bed and sometimes even in your dreams you know you'll you'll see that then let's see helen thompson does marrying a person from another religion changes your karma to the worst? What about bringing up your children in a different religion than yours? No. If you're destined to marry somebody of a different culture and ethnic background, you're going to do it. And there is nothing. Because what you're doing right now is you're saying that, well, that religion is worse than mine. So now my karma is going to go down. Well, no. Then, no. There's no religion. Again, Religion is like a bucket of water from the same well. You can say this water is different, but I'm sorry. It's not. It came from the same well. You can name it whatever you want. It's all, it's all one well. That's it. And now I can truly say it's just one well. Okay. Then... Okay, then uh, energy healing asked. No questions. I'm just looking for a medical astrology series from you. You know, that's something I kind of did, but then I stopped. Because what happens is all the deadly diseases, if I was to discuss those, especially on social media, it can put a lot of unnecessary fear into people. Because if I say, well, Rahu and 
you know, this person, this planet being this, this place is away from Rahu, being in this sign during this period, this particular disease can become active. Well, somebody who's about to start them with that position, you know, and if they have no way to get in touch with me to get details on that, they, they will be in fear, absolute fear. So you have to be very careful now what you do and say on social media. Back in 2015, 14, it was much simpler because there was not too many people paying attention to you. Now, every eye is upon you. So that's something I will more most likely do on Keras Vlogs. But again, one thing I will say is that without the education of Ayurveda, one cannot step into health astrology. That's why I don't. Until I actually learn depth of Ayurveda. Health is simply something that has to be specialized unless you're spending 24 seven doing your research in astrology. Okay, then. So how to see the timing when someone is miraculously healed? You mentioned this will happen to some people. Okay, da -da 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 -da, Rahu transit. You will see in Dasha, 8th and ninth Lord are playing a part in that sudden miraculous healing, including Jupiter being in amazing dignity. Okay, so 8th and ninth floor playing a part with Jupiter creating a yoga, particularly with that. So, for example, even if you look at uh, when Amitabh Bachchan had his accident, you know, it was the Gach Kesari Yoga with Moon being in the ninth house, transiting, and um, I forgot the other Paryantra Dasha of Shukra, Venus operating at the same time which became a sudden saving grace because literally they thought he wasn't going to survive but within weeks his ninth house period just started that's where the miraculousness came in and the karka of the ninth which was jupiter was exalted in the sixth house of health so these things have to play out but again you have to look at each chart is different each chart is like a thumbprint you know it's just it's different yes Two people can be actors, 10 people can be actors, you know, but their thumbprint has to individually say that this is an actor, 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 actor. So yes, you can have a lot of people in the same thing, doing the same thing, but again, they will all have that similar, little bit of that similar pattern on one of the lines. I don't know if that's a good example. Uh, How do we how do we know that a person is living his oh okay so Charvi Sharma asks how do we know the person living their last reincarnation on earth through astrology? Twelfth has become very significant. Ascendant Lord in the twelfth, aspected by either Moksha Lords, Ketu, Jupiter becomes the last birth. Pisces being in the twelfth house from your Karakamsha Lagna becomes, especially when Jupiter or Ketu aspect becomes a point of moksha. And there are three, four others. I have it in my noted down, but I don't focus on them every day. So that's why I don't uh, remember them, but I have them written down. These three, four placement, especially you will also find in, um, what was this book? Hold on. Uh, Bharat Jataka. Bharat Jataka by Bharamira. Um, importance use of Titi Panchanga in astrology. Okay, so there's many use. Mostly it's about Mahurta, right? But I'll tell you one of the most important things. One of the most simplest aspect of Titi is just to look at the nakshatra that moon is transiting on this particular day. Okay. So it becomes very important 
to see like what transit the moon is in on this particular day. When you just keep track of the moon, okay, moon nakshatra, you will see as an astrologer, your something starts to work in your brain where it improves your astrological ability on that day. If you just keep track of this one small thing of where moon is transiting. If let's say moon was in Vishaka yesterday, it would be in Anuradha by today. You know, it'll be in Jeshta tomorrow. If you can just keep track of this one simple thing, you don't have to know about the exact 16 Tithi, which is even better if you do, which Tithi is running. But just keep track of that. That's the most important part for an astrologer at least. Most important use to help somehow with their intuitive side of astrology. Um, what else? Interesting one. Okay. Mostly it's all individual placement which doesn't interest me. Okay. Um, does keeping medicines in a specific direction increases or decreases the effectiveness of medicine of a person? Yes, it does. Certain directions will slow the effect of um, medicines down. Certain directions will increase the effect of that. And I don't want to say exactly which direction right now because I don't have my notes. Um, where is my notes? Let's see if I can find my Vastu notes here. Because I don't deal with that specific thing, but I know I've, I've studied and I've actually taken notes on that because I've saved all my notes in this notepad thing. Uh, I believe it's Northeast because Northeast is connected with health. Uh, Hold on. Let me see here. Because I remember how I named my notes. Uh, boy. Let's see. Yeah. Um, I believe it's Northeast. North, East, and, but there's a specific, I'm just looking at my smartphone compass. Um, I believe it's 35 to 50, 51 degrees. Okay. Um, Either that, or most of the time, people like in US, the way kitchen, because usually everybody will put their medicines in kitchen area, which is usually in the Brahmastan. You know, that becomes neutral placement. But I have to, again, I'm, I'm just looking at some references on Google, but I can, I have to dig deep. I have so many things on my notes. So I have to, I have to get back on this one. But yes, there is. And especially like, for example, if you take your medicines on Ashwini, Hasta, and Swati days, they will have the quickest effect. So when you take, so, but let's say if you have to take your medicine every day, during the Hora of the moon, okay, during the Hora of the moon, the moon is naturally representation of medicines. And moon is fast. So when you take your medicine in the hora of the moon, it brings the quickest effect. So that's one way. So PB asked, um, will you go back to the rocket animation into your future videos for nostalgic sake? Yeah, sure, I will do that. <laughs> oh man, my younger days, was I a clown or what? But here's the thing, I'm actually building a new uh, animation logo. It's being done, my, uh, my animator has not, he's going so slow. 
man, he has been very frustrating on that point. I was supposed to have a new logo, a brand new logo. And I emailed him just yesterday. Hey, where's this logo? Some This computer's not working. Something, this happened, that happened. So I'm hopefully, you know what? Let's see if this Prashna, if this has question has arrived, let's look at the Prashna to exactly when I can get this logo three. Oh man, this is, this shows either 26 days or 26 hours. Let's see. I hope it's the latter one. So then the next question. Hmm. Some of these things are amazing. The question you're asking me, but it can be a very negative thing for me to say it here. But I do know what this person is saying about. Yeah, yeah. I won't even say the, the conjunction. Uh, let's see. How can I identify my spiritual gift or what I might master in the in, in this incarnation? Well, I can't tell you because I have to look at your chart. Uh, let's see again, individual guys, when you're saying, well, I have Mars and conjunction aspected by Saturn, what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen because I don't know the degrees, what they're landing in in Navamcha, what they're, are they in like Pushkara Navamsha? Are they in Sandhi? Are they, you know, um, in a particular yoga tara degree, yeah, all these things matter. So when you ask me individual questions, doesn't help. Okay. Can you do a Vastu course? Yes, I might. I might uh, next year though. Specific reason why next year. When Saturn enters Aquarius, that's when I might do it. But I'm right now working on my course of predicting without any planets just just the ascendant and what karma they play besides just a planet planet it's like you can imagine planet just being like garam masala on your potato but the potato is there that's the it's a potato so you can predict it's a potato but the garam masala of let's say mars will add on to that Right? So that's what it is. So Okay, so okay. All right. So guys, my laptop is not hooked up with my thing and my batteries. I didn't even realize my batteries at red on my laptop battery. So uh, I, I like this. I like this um, live. It, it helps me to answer many, many questions instead of just one, you know? Uh, let me see. Yes, this yes, this is uh, Saraswati. That is Saraswati. So, yes, she always has my back. Saraswati and then that's Lakshmi. Okay. That's, you will not find... This is a very um, ancient statue of Saraswati. Oh boy, and it's heavy. This is like 20, 30 pounds of Saraswati. Very ancient one. And there's a big significance behind this particular beat. One of my teachers gave it to me with energization. So, yeah. And, uh, if you want to see that Lakshmi, it's just very heavy. I don't want to pick it up. So anyway, guys, this was our live stream. I will do it maybe again one next week. All right.